Uh, next week on March 30th, we'll be doing a joint seminar with the uh, uh, SICE or School for Advanced International Studies China Africa Research Initiative, uh, where the SICE Carry Group, as they call themselves, will be unveiling their new data on Chinese overseas financing flows into Africa. Uh, that'll be at March 30th at, at 9 a.m. And then the GDP Center with the BU Center for the Study of Asia, uh, BU Center for the Latin American Studies and, and others have been organizing a series of seminars on the Belt Road Initiative uh, over the semester. And on April 2nd at 9 a.m., uh, we're co-sponsoring an event uh, that'll feature Deborah Brodigam, who's the director of the Sice Kari Institute, um, and she'll be talking about Chinese debt uh, uh, renegotiation uh, with Chinese characteristics. But I'm excited to introduce you to Maria Luz uh, Moreno Badia. Uh, and she, today she will be presenting work that she did here at Boston University, or at least did a lot of work here on at Boston University called Resource Mil Misallocation and Fiscal Decentralization Evidence from China. Uh, uh, Dr. Moreno is the deputy chief uh, at the International Monetary Fund's Fiscal Affairs Department, where she has led work on global debt and coordinated uh, issues around the IMF's fiscal monitor. Uh, during her career, she's worked on a broad range of issues, Brazil, China, Greece, Ireland, Spain, mostly related to debt, debt sustainability, uh, in fiscal financial interlinkages. Uh, we were very uh, privileged to be able to have uh, Dr. M uh, here all last year uh, as a distinguished visiting scholar. And I would be remiss to not sit, mention the fact that she's actually a Boston University graduate. She has a PhD from Boston University's uh, Department of Economics. And we're really excited to have her here. Uh, for those of you who are new to our seminar series, uh, we asked the speaker to speak for 25, 30 minutes or so. Uh, and then we have a conversation with all of you. If you look at the bottom right-hand side of your Zoom screen, you'll see a little Q&A button. First thing I'd like you to do is just to say your name and affiliation so we can get to know each other and then type your question in. Uh, after the presentation, I'll take two or three of them at a time, ask them to the speaker, ask her to, uh, to respond. Uh, and we'll do a couple of rounds of those uh, until the top of the hour at 10 o'clock. So without further ado, let me pass it over uh, to Maria Luz. And I'll set up your PowerPoint presentation. And just, um, just say next slide, please, or something like that. Um, when you are ready for me to move to the next one. Okay. Okay, perfect. So good morning. Uh, many thanks for the kind introduction. Um, it is a pleasure to be back at the GDB Center. Um, I still have kept very strong links, uh, including sign joint research work with uh, Kevin. Um, Today I will be uh, presenting a research, young research with Juhen Sao and Rafael Lan that was conducted while I was on sabbatical at Boston University. So let me first start the next slide, the next one, uh, with the motivation of the paper. So if we were to look back at the economic performance of China over the last 25 years, the only description that we could use is that it has been nothing short of remarkable. Since 1995, real GDP growth has been on average an annual 9%. And during this period, 1995 to 2019, um, what you have is that GDP per capita in US dollars has increased by a factor of 17. And all of this has taken place against like, the backdrop of a major banking crisis at the end of uh, the 1990s and the global financial crisis at the end of the last decade. Now, if you were to do a growth accounting exercise and identify what are the factors that explain this strong performance, clearly the massive investment in physical capital is one of the main contributors, but undoubtedly, Total factor productivity growth is also a major factor, particularly prior to 2008. However, since 
2008, basically since the onset of the global financial crisis, what you see in the left-hand side is that there has been a significant slowdown on GDP growth. Obviously, part of this is cyclical, related also to global factors, but part of this is a structural and is related to what you see in the right-hand side chart, which is basically kind of like the evolution of TFP growth since 1995. And if you were to compare the performance post-GFC relative to the pre-GFC period, what you will see is that TFP growth has declined by a factor of three. So the literature has tried to basically kind of like understand what are the factors and distortion that may explain this, this mal performance. And this is one of the focus that we have in the paper. Next slide, please. In particular, uh, what we look at is that whether fiscal decentralization is one of the factors that affect allocative efficiency in China and is solved through its channels. Next slide, please. So before uh, we go into the econometrics of uh, our paper, I think it's very important to understand what are the main characteristics of the fiscal decentralization system in China. And there are like two things that you need to basically kind of like be aware of. The first one in your left hand side is that China is the most decentralized country in the world in terms of subnational spending. Local governments account for about 85% of general government budgetary spending, a higher share if you account also for of budget spending. At the same time, China is relatively centralized in terms of revenue. This is what you see in the right-hand side table. Basically, local governments um, uh, collect about 60% of taxes, but they have very little discretion in terms of like tax rates and tax bases. Next slide, please. So these design features are basically kind of like the result of the major fiscal reform that took place in China in 1994. So what happened at the time was that they introduced VAT taxes and basically to, to replace some indirect taxes, but very importantly, they centralized revenues. So a result of which revenue collection increased significantly by more than 10 percentage points, but also at the, at the result of this was that a really big vertical imbalance between the revenue allocation and spending allocations across different levels of governments emerged. And what you see was a widening of fiscal deficits, actually kind of like at the beginning, local governments started with kind of like surpluses and increasingly they have bigger deficits. This is what you have in the left-hand side. And there is quite a bit dispersion across provinces. So what you see in the right-hand side is the difference in terms of the vertical imbalances, these funding gaps across different provinces in China. And what we are going to do in our empirical uh, research is to exploit this heterogeneity across provinces to identify whether this may give rise to inefficiencies, resource misallocation. Next slide, please. Next. So what is our empirical strategy? So what we do is basically first start calculating a metric of allocative efficiency at the province layer. So this is your uh, right PT. Uh, I will not go into the details we can discuss later in the Q&A um, uh, session. This is based on friend level data. And then we try to kind of like, you know, identify what are the factors that may explain differences across provinces in terms of that allocation efficiency. So we have like standard controls using the literature capturing policy distortions, market imperfections, information frictions, and other factors that may explain basically why you have these differences across provinces from what is infrastructure, what is basically kind of the market competition, degree of marketization. But also we look at whether fiscal decentralization and difference across provinces in terms of like the metrics of fiscal decentralization may explain these differences. Next slide, please. So among the fiscal decentralization metrics that we look at, uh, we divide them into two groups, what we call funding gaps and then a standard metrics uh, of decentralization. The funding gap, basically we have three metrics, vertical imbalances, that is basically kind of like this gap between the own revenue and spending, and alternative measures of transfer dependencies in terms of like transfers as percent of spending or own revenue. 
In terms of the degree of decentralization, we look at two metrics, the revenue decentralization, which is how much of the uh, revenue is basically kind of like raised by the local governments and expenditure decentralization, which is basically kind of like the major items over which the uh, local government has control and it's uh, one of the main responsibilities. Next slide. Now, once we have identified whether fiscal decentralization actually has an effect on resource allocation, we basically explore what are the channels through which this may happen. And basically our main focus is in trying to kind of like explore what are the consequences of these high vertical imbalances, which is basically that you have a funding gap. So we have two hypotheses that we test in this paper. What the local governments have to do is to deliver on two basic kind of like objectives. One is in terms of like a public provision of services. The second one is on growth targets. And because you have like these huge funding gaps, they need to find alternative uh, resources in order to basically kind of like deliver on those objectives. So there are two ways in which they are actually kind of like trying to achieve these uh, objectives given their limited funding. One is that they go to the market. And by going to the market and to basically the financial system, they may be crowding out the firms. The second one is by basically kind of using their supply of land. This is an important uh, source of funding for them. Uh, they provide leases because they have full control over the supply of land at the local government level. So what we think is that these create distortions. The first one is by going into the financial market, they are going to basically crowd out the uh, enterprises and basically kind of many of those are going to be financially constrained. So what we actually kind of test with hypothesis one is whether firms in provinces with higher vertical imbalances are more financially constrained than otherwise. And in order to do that, we estimate a model of investment based on an earlier equation and test whether those provinces where you have higher vertical imbalances firms are actually more cash sensitive in their investment decisions, meaning they will only invest if they have cash. And if that's the case, this means that they are financially constrained. So this is basically the first hypothesis that we test. The second hypothesis is whether those provinces with higher vertical imbalances will also have relative price of industrial line higher than in provinces that have lower vertical imbalances. And this is related to the structure of the land market in China. Local governments have like three types of land. They have industrial, commercial, and residential. Industrial land is usually offered at a lower price than commercial and residential because local governments are trying to attract firms and investment into those provinces since they provide basically kind of like a tax base, and at the same time, it helps them to deliver on growth objectives. However, providing that kind of industrial line is relatively costly. So what we are testing is that in those provinces where you have higher vertical imbalances, the relative price of industrial land will be higher. Next slide, please. Okay, so let me first now kind of like go into like the first stylized facts that we get. And let me give you a quick overview on the data. This is a very involved uh, um, uh, research project because we're using various uh, data sources. First, we use firm level data. This uh, comes from the National Bureau of Statistics and our survey of industrial firms. We have over 300,000 firms and you see the typology of firms at the bottom. About 33% uh, were SOEs at the beginning of the sample period, only 3% are SOEs at the end of our sample. We also use provincial data. We have uh, macro variables, uh, fiscal variables, in infrastructure variables, uh, human capital, marketization variables coming from different sources as um, listed in that uh, um, description. And then we use land transaction data. This is very novel. Basically, this covers over 190,000 transactions across China. And we have information about the price, the land use, land class, transfer type. And this is actually kind of like used for the identification of the second channel that uh, we discussed just earlier. Next slide. Okay. So, Based on this data, the first thing that we do is to calculate what is the resource allocation efficiency across China. 
And if you remember, uh, our empirical exercises try to explain what are the factors that may contribute to differences across provinces. So what the first thing that we establish is that there is a huge diversion of efficiency across provinces. In the left-hand side, you see the distribution of our metric, the resource allocation efficiency, higher number years, higher efficiency. And what you see is that actually that dispersion increase over time. In the right-hand side, what you have is the differences across provinces, and you see that the most efficient are in the East Coast. Next slide. And what you see is that this dispersion is large by provinces. In the uh, left-hand side, what you have is like uh, three sample provinces, and you see the distribution basically kind of like of the firms uh, for our full sample, and you see that they are quite a bit of discrepancies. And then in the right hand side, you see basically kind of like the differences in terms of like the revenue productivity by sectors. So what we do is just calculate what is the province with the kind of like highest efficiency and what is the problem with the lowest efficiency by different sectors. And you see that for example, in the beverage sector, the lowest basically kind of like the province with the lowest efficiency, it's 40% has a level of efficiency that is 40% of the province with the highest efficiency. And you see by other sectors, it's actually lower. So you have like a huge dispersion. Next slide. Okay, so having established that we have like a huge dispersion uh, across provinces, what we are trying to do next is trying to explain what are the factors that may explain those differences across provinces. So as uh, I explained at the beginning, the specification that we use controlled by standard factors that are considered in the literature, like policy distortions, like for example, subsidies, uh, by information kind of like asymmetries, for example, kind of like differences in inflation across provinces, and by kind of like different market structure, for example, in terms of like the infrastructure, in terms of like the competition but also by different metrics of uh, the fiscal decentralization system. And here I'm just showing three of them, the vertical imbalances, the transfer dependency, the two alternative measures, because this is the most important channel that we find in our paper, which is the funding gap. The fact that you have like a huge gap between the revenues and the expenditures at the provincial level. This specification that I show in here is actually kind of like controlling for the fact that the metrics of fiscal decentralization may be endogenous. Uh, I don't have time in this presentation to go over the specifics of what we do, but we can discuss at the end of the uh, presentation. Uh, and basically what you have is different specifications for different metrics. And in all specifications, what you find is that there is a negative significant effect of the measure of fiscal decentralization on resource efficiency. So what it means is that those provinces with higher vertical imbalances or with higher transfer dependency have lower efficiency than other provinces. And those effects are macro significant. So if you look at the specification in column two, what you see is that one standard deviation decline in the vertical imbalance decrease basically kind of like uh, uh, the vertical imbalance of the gap that you have, increase the resource allocation efficiency by 32%. This is really a massive impact. Next slide, please. Okay. So the next thing that we try to do is try to identify, okay, we have established that there is quite a bit of discrepancies in terms of like resource kind of like uh, allocation across provinces. There are some provinces that are really inefficient, other provinces that are more efficient. We have established that these differences are explained to a large extent by basically like features of the fiscal decentralization system. The fact that you have a high funding gap, the fact that these provinces kind of like uh, have revenues that are not enough to cover the spending responsibilities. So the next thing is that why this will have an effect on resource allocation efficiency. And the two hypotheses that we're trying to test are whether basically kind of like by having kind of higher vertical imbalances and by having this funding cut, the fiscal decentralization system is 
increasing financial frictions. And then second is creating land market distortions. So the first thing that we do is estimate a model kind of like of investment at the sectoral level and try to see to what extent those provinces that have higher vertical imbalances are more sensitive in their investment uh, decisions to the availability of cash. So next slide, please. Okay, so what we have here is uh, the coefficients of the cash sensitivity for uh, non-SOEs and SOEs by sectors. So basically what you expect is that if firms are financially constrained in those provinces where you have higher vertical imbalance, this coefficient will be positive. So what is the first thing that uh, uh, you should uh, uh, look at in this table? The first thing is that there is a large number of sectors for which non-SOEs are more financially constrained in those provinces with higher vertical imbalances. Those are basically kind of like the sectors that are marked in red. But this is not unique to non-SOEs. In other words, you have also SOEs that are going to be financially constrained because they do not have access to finance in those provinces where you have higher vertical imbalances. Now, it is the case that in general, you have less sectors for which SOEs are financially constrained in terms of uh, numbers and in also in terms of value added. But what this basically kind of like portray is a picture in which financial constraints are very real and very important and actually are closely linked to the funding of the local governments. So this is the first distortion or the first channel through which the uh, feature of the fiscal decentralization system in China has an impact on resource allocation. Next. The second channel that we look at is the distortions in the land market. And basically what we are trying to figure out is whether the changes in the prices of kind of like land are related to the feature of the fiscal decentralization system. So as I mentioned earlier, we have like a novel data set covering 192,000 uh, transactions over the sample period. And these transactions, for these transactions, we know the location of the transaction, what type of land, what characteristics of the land in terms of the class of land, uh, the price, the area of the land. And basically what we try to test is whether the changes in the land prices are related to whether the province is a province with high vertical imbalance or not. And what we are actually zeroing it's on the behavior for the pricing of industrial land. And the reason, as I mentioned earlier, is that industrial land, it's a, a type that is usually provided at a lower price per square, uh, let's say kind of like a meter or in this case hectare, uh, than commercial or residential in general. And it's costly for local governments to supply the land because basically they are costs associated with the provision of the land in terms of infrastructure, et cetera. So what we test here is that in those provinces with higher vertical imbalances, with higher funding gaps, the relative price of industrial land is actually higher than in provinces with lower uh, vertical imbalances. So what you have in all of these specifications in which we have controls for uh, supply and demand factors in terms of kind of like land prices, is that that coefficient is positive, meaning that industrial land, although in general has lower prices than commercial and residential land, that wedge is actually reduced in those provinces with higher vertical imbalances, with higher uh, funding gaps. And therefore, this will result in a distortion basically in capital and a distortion in terms of like the entry and exit of um, firms that will result in lower resource allocation efficiency. Next slide. So with this, I wanted to kind of like just uh, recall what are the main takeaways of like this uh, research. The first one is that misallocation varies across provinces and actually the dispersion is really large. 
and increase over time over our sample period. The second one is that we identify that uh, apart from the standard factors that explain resource misallocation, the specific features of the fiscal decentralization system in China actually play an important role through the funding gap. Uh, it is not actually the expenditure decentralization. We have like some analysis that I haven't presented today um, uh, looking into this. It's actually the funding gap. The fact that revenues are not enough to cover the spending needs. And the impact is macro significant. It's really large. And basically the challenge through which these uh, features have an effect on resource uh, misallocation are two we have identified. We have identified that through the funding gap, the local governments are creating financial constraints because they go to the market and basically kind of they crowd out the firms. It affects non-SOEs, but also SOEs. And the second distortion that they create is that in those provinces with higher vertical imbalances, relative prices of industrial land are significantly higher. And with this, I think that um, I will stop here and we can actually um, move now to the Q&A. Wonderful. Thanks so much for that clear and excellent presentation. Uh, those of you in the audience, I invite you to go into the Q&A box down in the bottom, uh, introduce yourself and ask a question. We see there's a bunch already. I'll uh, ask you two or three and you can respond and we can do a, a couple rounds for a little less than a half hour if we may. Um, uh, first question is from William Grimes. Uh, he's a political economist here at the party school at BU. And he says, can you explain how the central government decides how to distribute funds across provinces? Is there a set formula that takes into account economic and demographic factors, or is it the result of political negotiation? Also, he just wants to note that another country where most spending is done by provinces, while most revenue is collected by the central government is Japan. That's question number one. Uh, uh, question number two is from uh, Yan Wang. Uh, she's a new senior researcher here at the GDP Center after a long career as an economist at the World Bank. Uh, she says, when China had a higher level of fiscal, fiscal decentralization, there was a worsening of income inequality. Now you find that China has more centralized fiscal revenue. It seems that income inequality is improving. Misallocation is currently very large it seems incentives of provinces are moving in the wrong, direc wrong direction. Is that right? So there's two to start with. And while uh, Maria Luz is answering these, uh, please add some more and we'll, uh, we'll come back to them. Okay, so on the um, features of the fiscal decentralization system in China. So prior to the 1994 uh, fiscal reform, transfers uh, uh, were done on an ad hoc negotiated basis. So this is basically what you describe as kind of like a, um, one of the possible mechanisms. Now, post-1994, they move into a rule-based mechanism that certainly takes account of like differences in terms of development across provinces. So I haven't showed you in this presentation, but if you look at the transfer dependency, you have some provinces um, like uh, Tibet that they have like a huge uh, transfer dependency while other ones like Shanghai have much lower. So in part of this kind of like is related to like these differences across provinces. Not only do they take into account the level of development and resources, but it's also the case that they take into account to a certain extent idiosyncratic shocks. Uh, I will actually uh, direct you to uh, the Selected Issues paper that was released this January by the China team, in which actually they look at the um, uh, transfer system in China, trying to figure out to what extent they are able to dampen the consequences of like COVID-19 and also basically a lot of differences across provinces. And they find that to a certain extent, the system kind of like deals with like some of these idiosyncratic shocks that may affect some provinces more than others, but not fully. So this is regarding the transfer system in China. Now, regarding the distortions that the um, uh, fiscal decentralization system has uh, imposed. Uh, 
So clearly, um, uh, the reform of 1994 have like many beneficial effects. Um, among others, there was a significant increase in revenues. I think I mentioned that just more than 10 percentage point of GDP. Uh, however, um, one of the major, let's say, kind of like downsides of this system is that it creates a huge funding gap that local governments have to basically fill in one way or another. So basically what they uh, typically do is that they resort to first basically um, going into the financial system. They can do it basically kind of like off budget. Uh, this has been usually the case with local government financing vehicles, but they can also do it on budget. And the result of this is that if the financial system is relatively underdeveloped or the funding needs are significant, they will be crowding out the uh, corporate sector. Now, what you have is that this affects more non-SOEs than SOEs. And if you have looked at some of the analysis that have come out on the productivity of SOEs and non-SOEs, by constraining the access to finance of SOEs, but morely, mostly non-SOEs, what you are going to do is kind of like create these distortions in which you have very productive firms in general, uh, non-SOEs are more productive, that do not have access to capital. And therefore, basically, overall productivity is going to be lower in those provinces. So that's basically kind of like the negative distortions that you have. The second one, in terms of like the incentives that the local governments are doing is that you have the land market, and as I mentioned, they have the residential, commercial, and industrial land. These are th three different types. So typically what local governments do is that they go into the market and they use the residential and commercial land to basically fill in the gaps, meaning, okay, I'm going to supply it on the basis of my funding needs, not on the basis of what is the demand in the market, but on the basis of my kind of like uh, funding needs, which create distortions in the market. But what matters for us in terms of like the performance of firms and the basically resource misallocation is that they're also creating distortions in the industrial land because it is costly for the local government to supply that type of land. So when they have funding needs, it's not only that they're going to be supplying residential and commercial land on kind of like a funding need, but it's also the case, this is a hypothesis that we are trying to kind of like to test, that that kind of like pricing may be different. And the weights that you usually have between the residential commercial and the kind of industrial land is actually reduced, meaning those firms that want to establish and serve in those provinces that have higher vertical imbalances will pay higher relative prices. And this actually kind of like will serve as a barrier to entry, and it will actually affect resource allocation and productivity in those provinces. Great. Uh, a couple more questions here. And folks, please uh, feel free to put them in, in the chat. We have Ralph Cintron from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Yes, uh, you know, how good is the record keeping or the data here? Uh, how much confidence can we have in these flows? And how much of the economy functions, quote unquote, informally? We hear all a lot about the shadow banking system in uh, in China, but doesn't don't see that so so much in in the conversation here. And then, if I could add one, uh, which you alluded to uh, in your in your uh, in your response to the last question, um, and it it might be lurking in the regressions with respect to the land, but uh, as we know that uh, many of the local provinces create these off balance sheet special pur purpose vehicles, which are collateralized by land prices in order to get loans from the China Development Bank. That's really been one of the key engines of finance more so than government, go uh, government transfers is bank loans from the CDB. Um, and that, and that they, they bet that the industrial parks and so forth that they finance with uh, with the bank loans will obviously uh, increase the uh, value of real estate and that allows them to, to sort of hedge or to collateralize those, that loan uh, in order to, to be able to pay it back, but to keep it, to keep it off balance sheet. Um, and you know, we know from, from the CDB that their main, their main land balance sheet is, uh, is around $1.5 trillion. So this is a serious amount of money that's, um, that's out there in the domestic economy. And, how does that square in your regressions? Is that uh, 
omitted variable bias here, or is it somehow implicitly captured in your industrial land uh, uh, independent variable? Can answer these two. Hopefully, we'll get a couple more. Okay, so first on the data quality. Um, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, in terms of like the sources, we're using the MBA's annual industrial uh, survey uh, for the fin level data. Um, we do extensive uh, cleaning in line with the uh, work that other researchers have done, published in the JDE and QJE, uh, but still clearly. Um, data kind of like mismeasurement problems uh, may be an issue. We are currently working on um, some kind of like a further robustness checks kind of like a, based on a recent methodology uh, developed by Cleno and others to try to address at least some of these measurement problems, but clearly uh, measurement may be uh, an issue. Um, still, we feel confidence that uh, to a certain extent, this will be kind of like captured by some of the controls that we have uh, to the extent that this apply uh, equally across all provinces. Now, if, if we were basically kind of having kind of like a, a situation in which the data quality of some provinces is better or worse than others, um, that will be actually kind of like uh, difficult to address, although we have kind of like some fixed effects that may kind of like uh, control for these, let's say, kind of like uh, differences across provinces. Now, in terms of like the uh, question that you have raised, Kevin, on the, um, uh, the uh, of budget kind of like a borrowing. Uh, one thing that uh, I mentioned in data, but maybe it was not uh, very clear is that the focus of our analysis is the period 1998 to 2007 for a reason. And is that uh, there have been two waves of the uh, annual uh, industrial surveys uh, produced by the MBS. The one, the first one was from 98 to 2007, the second one for 2008 to 2013. And we did actually look into the second period. And unfortunately, the data has serious problems. They are like, it's not only that some of the years are missing, but there are significant data gaps that prevent us from actually calculated uh, TFP. And this is, uh, you will see that uh, no researcher has been able actually to address these data problems. So the, the type of transactions that you are actually kind of like indicating also kind of like what uh, one of the questions was, was about shadow banking, et cetera, are particularly relevant in that second period that we don't cover. But still to a certain extent, in terms of like how you are thinking about like of budget transactions, we are actually kind of like covering part of this. And we have like tons of controls in our specification. I didn't go over all the details, but actually we have kind of like tried uh, an extensive number of, um, of controls. Uh, unfortunately, um, data on the bond market, it's limited for the period that we are looking at. And even kind of like for the second period, we'll have some difficulties in terms of like looking at the debt of, uh, let's say, local government financing vehicles. However, we think that by capturing the underlying problem, which is the funding gap, that is actually going to kind of like, a, you know, result in the resort to kind of like this of budget sources, we are capturing a lot of those dynamics. Now, in terms of the land kind of like dynamics, um, we do not have like all the details in that specification, but basically we control extensively for anything and everything that you can think of in terms of like both demand and supply factors, and also kind of like the uh, structure of the financial market. So to a certain extent, again, we are capturing um, this uh, mechanism. And what we think is that these distortions are really important. It's not like a um, footnote, it's actually kind of like macro relevant and what it means is that if you want to address part of the problem that we identify in our motivation, which is there have been a significant slowdown of growth that is linked to basically kind of like a, you know, TFP growth basically kind of like being uh, reduced by a factor of three, you are going to have to address the shortcomings in the fiscal decentralization system in China, which means that you have to address the issue of the intergovernmental kind of like, let's say, relationships, the transfer system, the funding, the revenue kind of like uh, 
raising ability of these local governments. Thanks so much, we had a couple more. Uh, one is from Manny Say Compersard. Uh, she's from Lao PDR and she's a master's student in economics at Yamaguchi University in Japan. Her question's about the fiscal decentralization indicator that you have. Why are you selecting vertical fiscal imbalance and transfers as the FD indicator, while there are other important indicators such as revenue, expenditure, tax effort, and so on? Then we have another from Ilana Bastiani. She's a student from Murdoch University and says, besides the change in real estate prices, what other macro effects does the vertical imbalances have on the provinces? For example, do you, do you find people moving to better funded areas? Okay, so in the first question, we did actually look into other metrics. I didn't present those uh, today. I think in the additional slides that we have there, uh, we have some of this specification in which we look specifically at the revenue decentralization and expenditure decentralization. And what we get is that uh, funding gap matters, the revenue decentralization matters, expenditure decentralization doesn't. Meaning it's not a matter of like the provinces getting more spending responsibility, it's a matter of provinces not getting enough funding to actually deliver on those uh, spending responsibilities. Uh, the other question that uh, I think was uh, racist, remind me, Kevin. Um, um, uh, besides the change in real estate prices, what other macro effects does the vertical imbalances have on the provinces? Interesting question. I, it doesn't seem to be in the regressions, but uh, for example, do you find people moving to better funded areas? Are, is there a labor migration? Yeah, no, we, we haven't really looked at this um, uh, issue. It's important. Um, obviously, this is like um, a difficult question because you have, let's say, um, legal constraints in terms of like the mobility of, of people across provinces. So this will be another barrier, let's say kind of like in terms of like the equalization. For us, we were uh, particularly concerned about capital misallocation because in all the studies I have tried to identify what are the major sources of misallocation in China. Capital misallocation is one of the main ones. And for us, the capital misallocation was translated into um, firms not being able to access to finance, to invest in capital. And what you will have is that you have, uh, let's say, a discrimination across firms. And what you have is that the capital may be allocated to firms that are not particularly productive, because, for example, financial constraints affect more non-SOEs than SOEs, while non-SOEs are kind of more productive. And also in terms of like entry. So what you have is that if the relative price of industrial land is higher and you are a firm that you are trying to establish yourself in a province, if the relative price is higher, let's say in kind of like uh, Hubei than in kind of like Shanghai, you're going to go to Shanghai, right? When you kind of like decide. What this means is that you're going to have less competition, basically kind of like in the uh, Hubei provinces, that's the case. And then as a result of all of this, what you're going to have also is that positive effects that you have in terms of TFP, like spillovers because of R&D or whatever, will not materialize in those provinces and the overall productivity will be lower. So this is the type of distortion that we identify in our research, that you have these kind of like relative prices of industrial land that are going to have an effect because it's a higher kind of like cost of capital, it's a distortion. So therefore, when you are making your decisions in terms of like, are I going to enter into this province or not? And in terms of your profit maximization, this is actually going to have a significant impact. Terrific. Uh, no, another question from Yan Wang. She says, uh, aging is a big issue for slower growth. Are the transfers across provinces related to the aging process of the labor force as compared to the efficiency of enterprises? Well, the transfers, um, uh, the, the aging process is um, something that is ongoing. And I think that I don't remember exactly when is the cliff, but I think that let's say the, the worst of it is still yet to come. So it doesn't really affect the sample period that we are talking about. However, the transfers are going to take into account the provision of public services and the basically kind of like the uh, income, let's say, uh, status of the province as a whole. So as I mentioned to you in the presentation, when you saw the vertical imbalances, um, you could 
basically kind of like uh, more or less related this with transfer dependency. So the provinces that were at the bottom, you were having Shanghai and Beijing, are going to be less transfer dependence. In other words, are going to receive less transfers in relative terms than the provinces that actually have higher vertical imbalances. And this is related to the spending needs, some of which may be related to kind of like um, age-related spending and uh, the income that you have. And as you saw, basically kind of like uh, our measures of spending short decentralization, also look into the health and the kind of like education spending, because these are two of the types of spending that kind of like uh, account for a lion's share of spending on the local government. So the health spending is also related to the aging and that will be basically part of like what is reflected in our spending kind of decentralization, but also the, the counterpart is the transfer dependency. Great. Well, let me ask you to make, make some, some final remarks. Uh, uh, one, what, uh, what do you see as the future directions here uh, in, in terms of the research? And two, obviously taking off your IMF hat and your own personal capacity, uh, what, is this, what are the policy implications of this, um, of, this, of this research, even though you know, obviously it's still in a development stage? And then a third question, which is related to all that, uh, since you're a BU grad, um, what kind of, there's lots of BU uh, students uh, part of this webinar. Uh, what would you recommend for uh, young social scientists here at BU? Uh, uh, what kind of skill sets, what kind of, what kind of advice would you give them so that they can go on to uh, have the kinds of insights that you've sh shared with us today? So um, I do think that this uh, um, research um, underscored the importance of um, having a close look at the um, design features of the fiscal decentralization system in China and um, addressing its shortcomings. The authorities are very much aware of this. This is nothing uh, new. But what it puts into context is that the macro significance of this is massive in terms of like a total factor productivity and taking into account that we're looking at a country in which there has been a significant slowdown in growth. So basically, I think I mentioned to you from 1995, you have like a growth on average of 9%. By 2015, it fell below 7%. I'm not going to talk about 2020 because it's kind of like a kind of like one of the year with COVID. But basically, before COVID, China was a country in which you were having a significant slowdown and a big chunk of that slowdown was explained by a decline of TFP. So if you take these uh, results at face value, what we are saying is that you have like a huge kind of like inefficiencies um, as a result of like the distortions that the fiscal decentralization system imposes on local governments, which is they have a huge funding gap, they need to deliver on the growth objectives, on the kind of like spending kind of like mandates. And basically what they are going to do is find a way to deliver on those, which is, okay, I'm going to go to the financial markets, I'm going to crowd out whoever I have to crowd out so that I kind of like, you know, I kind of like deliver and I'm going to use the land market as a source of kind of like revenues, which means that I'm going to offer it not according to the market forces, but when I need funding, I'm going to offer it in a way that satisfies my funding needs. So if you want to address the problem of like the slowdown of TFP in China, you're going to have to take a very serious look at these shortcomings and address them. And this means kind of like a reforms of the fiscal decentralization system. There are like a some kind of interesting references I can send to those who are interested in this issue of research that has been done on the fund uh, in terms of like the type of reforms that could address the shortcomings. Now, in terms of like the uh, skill set of uh, uh, BGU graduates, I would say that for anybody that does public policy, an important uh, component is to, to have like a a good kind of like a technical, um, let's say, skill set to conduct um, empirical analysis. Uh, I think that uh, I would strongly recommend anybody doing uh, a master's or I guess a PhD is that uh, build up your technical skills. And I think that here, obviously, there is the standard econometrics um, that are used in the economics field. There is the new kind of very promising field, Kevin knows, uh, machine learning. I do think that it's worth investing in those tools because uh, I think increasingly we find 
new data sets coming onto basically kind of like the academic uh, area that allow us the possibility to explore questions that before uh, were not feasible because we didn't have the data. But for that, you need to know the tools and actually kind of like, this is a feeling which there has been quite a bit of like uh, innovation over the last 20 years since I, guess, since I graduated. So uh, I will strongly encourage students at BU to invest on those tools and kind of like get uh, intimately familiar with, with those uh, techniques. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, if you look in the chat, you'll see that uh, we put links to, uh, to a number of, of related, uh, related reports and, and working papers, and hopefully this will be in, in that form soon. Um, and we invite you to come back on March 30th with a discussion on uh, Chinese overseas finance in Africa. And then on April 2nd, a similar conversation, but more related to the current debt crisis and China's engagement in uh, uh, debt, debt renegotiations across the African continent. I uh, really want to thank Maria Luz for joining us here today. And we look